So again, that would be very deep down there, quite dangerous. Yeah, one thing we never do on this channel, as a me and you on this channel. Taking kiss. A kiss. <laughs> First job, Rebecca, is to find the pathway that's not actually a pathway. There's a pathway there, so that, not going on that's pathway. not the pathway. The pathway that we're trying to find is not a pathway. One of the things that we love doing on this channel is exploring old historical routes, abandoned railways, abandoned canals, and trying to learn about the history of them, how they developed and came to be today. Now, on occasion, we get comments from you guys telling us that we don't always look at the sort of the basics of how uh, an old canal would have worked. Today, we thought we'd take a step back and deal with some of the basics on exactly how a canal function with two really important uh, features. So in the late 1700s, coal was discovered in Somerset or Somersetshire. One of the um, symptoms of that, is that the right word? Not symptom, but one of, <laughs> one of the consequences That's better. of that uh, was this canal, the Wilts and Barts Canal, which took um, a route from Semington uh, down on the Kennet and Avon all the way up to Abington to the Thames and gave another route into London. That was its goal and it did that fairly successfully for the first sort of half century before the railway came along and took over. Like many canals it tells that same story. And here is the first feature we're going to show you today. It's a uh, an old abandoned lock, there's not much left of this one. So all around us now um, is a lot of old bits and pieces, a lot of old relics down there on the floor. Some of the hinge parts for the, for the lock all the way down there in the actual old lock itself. There's some brickwork. So there's a lot still here that you can kind of see on this uh, little stretch of canal. Now more importantly, back onto today's subject, all around us there you can see a huge ridge. Now we're roughly at about 70, 68, 70 metre contour above sea level and the huge ridge in front of us here is probably about 25, 30 metres higher. We need to get up to around about 95, 100 metres in quite a short space of time. So exactly how did they do that? So let's assume with this high quality graphic that the ridge in front of us goes on for 20 miles or so. Well you can't build a tunnel and you can't defy physics, so let's stick our water on the canal at each level. And let's dig out, well let's call this a lock. Now you'll also note that we have a vessel. Let's try and get that vessel downhill. So let's introduce a sluice and a culvert into that chamber. Hey presto, we now have a lock full of water. So let's close the sluice off and open the upper lock gate. When the water is balanced and level, well, in goes our little vessel. Now we need to let the water out of the lower lock gates in a controlled manner, which will lower our vessel until we're at the bottom and equal with a lower level of water. Now if we open the bottom lock, our little vessel can chug along to its heart's content. But, you might recall that in this case here, I said we have 25 metres to climb. That's huge and realistically we've probably only done a few metres in that one lock at best. So the easy answer is build more locks, which is why we have seven here, yes seven, here today to look at. But then we have another serious problem on our hands. So that's the second lock we've seen today. Looks like it's in part restoration from the Wilkes and Barks Canal. A lot more to be done there. And between what is the second lock we've come across today and the third, which is just ahead of us, got a huge, what looks like a winding hole where maybe you turn your boat round. But I wonder actually if it's not, I wonder if it's just a, a big expanse to um, sort of increase the distance between the locks, maybe. So why increase the distance between the locks? Let's get back to this excellent graphic. So we're now faced with the same problem again. We need to get downhill. Well, let's just build more locks, right? As many as we want, in fact. Let's stick another one just here. 
Same principle, let's let more water into our new lock. But wait, we have a problem. We're now running out of water between the locks and well, that's not good for our little vessel. In fact, now we've become grounded. So effectively, we need to increase the distance between each lock for allow for more water. But without the actual physical distance you need, well, then you need to fill, build artificial ponds or pounds. Effectively, you have now added distance between each lock. Right, so let's lower our vessel once again and carry on delivering some coal. And more importantly, show you some utterly joyous bits that are ahead of us on today's little adventure. So the third lock that we've seen today looks very much more uh, restored and uh, brick lined throughout. Got um, sort of a ladder down in, steps down in, and uh, yeah, it looks absolutely brilliant. I think all we would need here potentially are some lock gates. So uh, some great progress been made here on lock three. A few more to go before we get to something really rather interesting. And now all of a sudden you can tell that after four locks, we're getting up towards halfway over the ridge. Um, quite a drop now behind us in this short space of time. And at the top of that ridge is something integral to this canal. I think we're just approaching Tro's Bridge. T-R-O-W, Tro's Lane, Tro's Bridge. And I guess um, that could be a hat tip to the boats used on the um, Thames and Seven. Um, deep excavations is actually maybe we're not at Trose Lane. Maybe this is actually the fifth lock of today hidden down here somewhere. I would say it is. I assume this is going to be a bridge here, but we're not. There's no lane ahead of us. So actually, we're going for this to be a um, a lock. And there's clearly been nothing done here. You can see, oh yeah, you can see all the masonry, Rebecca, and uh, brickwork on the far side. There's about 150, 200 meters that way to the road along the canal line. Mm -hmm. I misread the map that they sent me and I assumed you could walk this bit, but you can't. This is the most sort of aggressive barbed wire. It is you... very barbed wired. Yeah. So we can't walk that way because it, the, the, the gate is sort of chained. There's barbed wire all the way across the top, the bottom, the sides, private land, no public railway. It's only 150 meter stretch. What a little corridor this would make for sort of you know walkway why would you why would you need to feel the need to fence that off so nobody can enjoy it there's a hundred years of canal that took that route and you've kept it to yourself well done so the frustration is i really want to get to that point 150 meters that way to show you what is sort of integral to this video and uh, the canal itself and what we're talking about today which is how canals worked so to do that we're going to have to walk in a big loop back towards where we came from up the top of the hill back down the hill just to over there so um let's do that in a quick montage stop the montage i'm still gonna rant here we go right 150 meter stretch not open to the public people aren't going to come and walk this stretch up and down here because it's not a through route it's a dead end and then back again that's not attractive to someone that wants to walk the dog or just go for an afternoon stroll or an evening stroll and if people aren't walking here people aren't going to care about it people aren't going to want to see this done people aren't going to donate money people aren't going to do all the things that make their community better open that last stretch and make this a community asset make this for for generations to come not just your generation not just you personally who owns that silly little bit of land there open your land make it accessible for your community so everyone can enjoy it and everyone can increase the value of their life and their happiness for goodness sake people stop closing little pockets of land that are for you open bits of land that are for everybody let everybody enjoy the world that we live in you're not here for that long so for goodness sake sort your life out and let everyone else enjoy it Ugh. Well, we can't see it from here, but the ridge of the hill, but just down that hill there is Tockenham Reservoir. 
Now when you go and you look and you research at how the Wilkes and Barks was filled with water, you come up with the River Marden we mentioned on the uh, western end, and then middle to uh, east you see uh, Coates Reservoir in Swindon. What about this section? Well, there it is, huge reservoir just there. But there's nothing to say that I can see that actually it was built for the canal. But it was constructed and opened in 1810. That's the same year as the canal. And it, the brook, Lily Brook, feeds in to the top of the, uh, the seven locks we were just at. So it fits really well that that reservoir was built to feed the Wilson Barts Canal. What we want to do on this little journey is have a look and see if we can find the entrance point. Is there a sluice? Is there just a, an overspill? How exactly did that reservoir keep water there and feed the canal? Yep. <laughs> yeah, one thing we never do on this channel, as a me and you on this channel. Take a Kiss. Look. Kiss. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Sorry, go on. <laughs> do you know one thing we don't do on this channel, which, uh, which we never do and we probably should do? What? We never advertise the fact that we have a Patreon and a YouTube membership. Oh, no, we don't. And what the benefits are of that. We're going to sort out the tiers in the next few weeks. But the point being, we do have a Patreon and a YouTube membership. So if you like this type of content, you can, you can hit those links in a doobly doo below and support the channel. We didn't realise a bit naively, we just bumped into a, a local lady who just told us all the history of this area. Just wonderful stories. This here is the, the, the embankment of the canal, the, the, the towpath of the canal. So that there, which we just thought was, was the brook and we were going to find the canal a bit further on, that's the canal there. We didn't realise we were quite as close to it. So the bit we filmed just back there by the gate, well, that is exact spot where the lily brook came in and fed this bit of the canal. But the fascinating thing is, the lady we just spoke to said that the, the uh, Tockenheim Reservoir from Lily Brook was not man enough to do the job of supporting this canal and that's why the coats was built. So this was sort of almost an embarrassment, they didn't build it big enough or deep enough or whatever or far enough down the valley for it to hold enough water. And we've seen the seven big locks back that way uh, towards Dauncey and how much water they'd have taken every single time a vessel went down. now sort of in the canal on this footpath and you can see just over there um, that's another point where the brook would have entered the canal. I would kind of hoped in some ways to see some more mechanism or something physical where there was a sluice or an overspill or some brickwork or something to suggest that that's the point. So this has been the very short story on how a canal works. Two of the basic principles, locks, reservoirs and stuff like that. Hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget we've got a Patreon. If this is the sort of content that you guys enjoy, um, hit that in the uh, link below. Otherwise you can go and watch our playlist on canals which will appear just here.